Across Ukraine, the Russian military appears to be stepping up attacks on what's called civilian infrastructure. What that means is schools, hospitals, homes are being targeted. Even a grand old theater with the word children spelled out in Russian in big letters on the pavement front and back. Rescue crews are still trying to reach those who survived the airstrike of the theater in Mariupol. Hundreds of civilians have taken refuge inside after their homes were destroyed. And once again, the U.S. is accusing Russia of war crimes. The Secretary of State echoing a similar allegation made by the President a day earlier. The International Criminal Court in The Hague has opened a war crimes investigation. Not surprisingly, no one has been charged and there are doubts anyone ever will be. But Secretary Blinken made the point that Russian actions speak for themselves. Yesterday, President Biden said that, in his opinion, war crimes have been committed in Ukraine. Personally, I agree. Intentionally targeting civilians is a war crime. After all the destruction of the past three weeks, I find it difficult to conclude that the Russians are doing otherwise. Catherine Cerner is the director on the Center of Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. She has written or co-edited six books on contemporary Russia. She is with us this hour from Toronto. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I want you to hear from an elected member of the Ukrainian parliament talking about some of the death and misery caused by Vladimir Putin and his military so far in Ukraine. I think that Putin has crossed all the red lines possible. We have over 100 children dead already and thousands of civilians killed in indiscriminate but sometimes precision fire on civilians. I think this is uh, the 1938 or the 1939 moments when Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia or Poland. Putin must know what he's done. He must be aware that he is responsible for actions which rise to the level of war crimes. And he's a repeat offender from Chechnya to Syria to Ukraine. He must know he's committed crimes against humanity. But at the end of the day, it seems, what, he's okay with that? He just doesn't care? So I think he sees the world a little differently. And remember, he's gotten away with those things as well. So we can call it crimes against humanity, but it really hasn't, has, you know, his perspective would be, well, I did what I had to do against an enemy that were terrorists. And I think that's the perspective uh, that he's convinced himself of uh, in Ukraine as well. So just to, to recap that, as long as he can get away with it, it's not a crime? Well, there hasn't been any punishment so far for either either of those things, right? And he's under sanctions right now but uh, by the U.S. for going back into Ukraine this time. Um, but uh, those sanctions aren't uh, for, for purported crimes against humanity, at least not at this point. So far, they've been for the very act of violating Ukraine's um, sovereignty. Um, so, and so what happens with attacks on civilians, I think, is, is yet to be uh, yet to be considered. It, maybe this Russian offensive is not going to plan, but if Grozny is an example, the siege on Mariupol is following a very similar timeline and tactics. Once Putin was done with Grozny, the UN described it as the most destroyed city on earth. Different war, same tactics, 2016 during the Battle for Aleppo. This time, you know, Syrian soldiers did most of the heavy lifting, but with the backing of the Russians and the Russian Air Force. So if Putin is true to form, will we be watching mass murder in the coming days and weeks being committed on an industrial scale in Mariupol and then to Odessa and then to Kiev? So I would say that's not impossible, and I wouldn't say it's just Putin. And I do think that's important um, because he's not the one who's actually launching those missiles that are hitting Ukrainian buildings and killing Ukrainian civilians. Of course, those are members of the Russian military. And this is a different military than um, the Soviet military. That was made up primarily of conscripts. This is made up primarily of professional soldiers um, who are trained on advanced weapon systems in a way that one-year conscripts can't be. So it's a different reformed military taking direct orders and being paid to do so. Um, so, you know, it is a, it is a Russian style of war. Um, and um, carpet bombing is something they've been known to do before. They also did it in the Soviet period, but even with this smaller, more... Uh, mobile force, uh, clearly, you know, uh, they're willing to do this. If Putin is to be stopped, does it all essentially now come down to China? Is Xi Jinping the only person who could convince Putin it's time to back down? Well, they have called one another their very best friends, and they've given each other the, the equivalent of, in the United States, the you know, Presidential Medal of Honor. Um, and they do, you know, speak to one another pretty frequently. Um, I know that Mr. Putin, when he went to see Mr. Xi uh, before the Winter Olympics just a month and a half ago, um, that was the first foreign leader that Mr. Xi had seen in two years. So 
Are they close? Yes, they're close in age. They're both authoritarian leaders. They're both kind of bad boys of the international system. Um, and there is an interdependence there. So uh, if they were to come down one side or the other, of course, I, I think Mr. Xi would be leaning on the Russian side as, as opposed to the Ukrainian side backed as it is by the West, which is a common enemy to Russia and, and China at this point in history. Catherine Serena, thank you so much. It's a complicated story and uh, one which is just getting more complicated uh, as it goes on. But we appreciate you being with uh, us. Unfortunately. Thank you yeah. for having me.